Peter Graste of the University of Queensland, Cheryl Soriano of the De La Salle University, and our moderator for this session, Clarissa David of UP. Hello. Hello. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I am very pleased to welcome to our panel today some esteemed colleagues. We will be uh, talking about disinformation and democracy. So this is the part of the program where we will discuss uh, how disinformation or fake news, as we sometimes call it, although that terminology has now been um, identified as problematic, how it could undermine democratic societies and systems and principles. Uh, together with our esteemed guests today, we will try to understand the scope and inclusions of what we call disinformation. Our panelists will discuss how disinformation undermines democratic processes and systems. So let me quickly introduce, reintroduce our panelists just quickly. Uh, Mr. Peter Gresti is an award-winning journalist and academic currently affiliated with the University of Queensland. He has 25 years experience as a foreign correspondent and has worked for Reuters, CNN, and BBC. Dr. Encinas is an assistant professor at the Political Science Department at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Um, and then Dr. Soriano is chair of the Communication Department at De La Salle University and has authored papers and books on digital media and social and political transformations. So we'll, we will, again, once you, if you have questions that occur to you as the panelists are speaking, please write them down on a piece of paper and then hand them over to our lovely uh, ushers over here and uh, in the shirts in green and they will, uh, those in green shirts and they will hand it over here and we'll ask the questions for you. If the question is uh, for a specific person in the panel, please write it down as well. So we'll start by hearing some initial thoughts from each of our panelists, around five to 10 minutes each. After that, we'll have some questions and discussions. And then everybody in the panel, I invite to ask everybody else questions if you have questions to the other. Why don't we start with Dr. Cheryl Soriano from De La Salle University. Thank you, Claire. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I prepared something, so I'll be reading some of parts of it. I'll try to sexify it as much as possible. <laughs> Most likely, I will fail. So 10 years ago, when I was starting my PhD, there was much enthusiasm about the empowering potential of the internet, prophesying the advent of a cyber democratic society or the emancipation of citizens from state power or market forces. Pierre Levy even anticipated the fall of dictatorships around the world, resulting from a participatory patriarchal culture and collective intelligence facilitated by online media. With all these hopes of the past, it is thus lamentable, as Tim Berners-Lee himself worriedly expressed last year about how the same affordances and features that help under-resourced groups are also used by certain sectors with bad intentions to gain the system for financial or political gain. What is the relationship between democracy and disinformation? To confront this relationship, I will use the three democratic participation axes proposed by some scholars, Vettel and Brindel in their analysis of cyber democracy, but try to simplify it. The first element focuses on the value of information, number one, and the model of an informed citizen, which is central to liberal democratic thought. Information is an important prerequisite for all forms of political participation. How can you participate and formulate an opinion without information? The internet has been praised for providing access to vast amounts of information, but also in democratizing this creation of information. As Peter Dahlgren argued, the open and accessible character of the internet also means that traditional centers of power have less informational and ideational control than previously held. Misinformation, or the unintentional sharing of the false information, and disinformation, or the deliberate intentional creation and sharing of information known to be false, are therefore both threats to democracy. Disinformation is worse because this is not just about people's inability to ascertain evidence-based information from those intended to be false, but it also manifests the role of orchestrators of this information, those that intentionally seek to manipulate, mislead, deceive, or silence evidence-based information for specific purposes, just such as the advancement of political agenda. Moving from information, the second axis is discussion and debate also crucial for democratic participation. 
which relies on the model of an active citizen who shapes his or his political opinion by participating in an exchange of views with those of other citizens or representatives. Theories of democracy have treated the discussion among citizens as vital to the functioning of a public sphere. Early enthusiastic accounts consider the internet as an incarnation of a harbor mash in public sphere based on rational critical discourse. This relates to one of the most saluted features of the internet, its interactive potential. Shirowiki even labeled this as facilitating sort of a wisdom of crowds. But as we all know and as evidenced by growing research, our experiences of social media counter these assumptions as we see a deep fragmentation and cheapening of our communicative interactions and debates online. Hate speech and trolling undermine these exchanges and so is disinformation in a broad sense, making it difficult to come up with meaningful rational critical exchange. The impassioned exchange of opposing views should not be seen as threatening itself, as argued by MOVE. Yet the problem is when loud, passionate voices of those seeking to mislead and spread warp messages end up silencing others. The third axis from information to discussion and debate is moving on to mobilization or coming together to act in concert. Participative citizens need to be informed and engaged in order to act collectively and mobilize for collective good. While some authors deplore a weakening of social ties in current societies, cyber enthusiasts argue that computer-mediated communication supports the, so the formation of social networks and new forms of community or associational life. And this has supported many under-resourced and dispersed activist networks, NGOs, people's organizations. The kinds of associational groups forged by the internet to advocate and advance social good needs to be celebrated very well. But it also gave rise to communities and associational groups and networks of disinformation without real ideological connection. Social and participatory media is key to manipulation because it enables those with fringe views to find each other, collaborate on media production and dissemination, and share viewpoints that would be inaccessible to air in traditional media, sometimes hiding under the veil of anonymity and thereby, thereby eliding responsibility. In short, the problem we have is that people have started to form ties and associational linkages and throw their support, as loose as they may be, with others, including those hired to advance political agenda to spread this information. So in bringing the three, I close. The problem of democracy in this day is, first, the intentional distortion of information or creation of false information and its active spread. Second, the participation and exchange by grassroots supporters and paid trolls and influencers around false claims that results in undermining the value of debate and discussion in this democratic society. And third, the mobilization by agents with strong political agenda of supporters, real supporters, to act in concert around intentionally falsified information. Thank you very much. Um, Next, we will hear maybe from a global view from Mr. Peter Gresti, and Peter Gresti has been um, also a victim of legislation against uh, the publication of false information. He was imprisoned for 400 days in Egypt, and maybe we can hear about his experiences. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm here, I think, although um, I'm carrying the, the title of Professor of Journalism and Communication at uh, the University of Queensland, um, I am here, I think, more as, as, as a practitioner, as a journalist who spent 25 years on the road. My last job was with Al Jazeera, um, where I was in Egypt and uh, arrested on terrorism charges and placed in prison. And I think there are two things that I really wanted to, to say in my opening remarks. The first is that there are two ways in which democracy in, um, can, can backslide on these things. Obviously, there's the malign way, the, the sort of democratic backsliding that we seem to be seeing here in the Philippines, in the, the sort of thing that we saw in Egypt. But there is also a benign backsliding, which is a kind of thing that we're even seeing in my own country, in Australia, where the governments, and let me go back, there is a common denominator in both these situations, where governments have been using national security as an opportunity, as an excuse to roll back on all sorts of democratic reforms, to close down freedom of speech, to, to silence the press, to introduce all sorts of laws that limit the work that the press can do. What happened to us in Egypt was 
a pretty egregious example of that kind of malign intent where the government passed laws that were designed, it said, to deal with national security. It said that, um, Egypt said that, or Egypt is, I think at the moment, the, third, the world's third um, most, the third biggest jailer of journalists behind Turkey and um, I think China. And Egypt says publicly that it, that it doesn't imprison journalists for their journalism. It says that it doesn't have any journalists as such in prison. It says that it only has terrorists. Now, that's exactly what happened to us. Where the government defined terrorism so loosely that to do your job meant that you were, in the government's eyes, promoting terrorist ideology. Now, that was a pretty, as I said, everyone's seen what's been taking place in Egypt. We've seen um, a dictatorship establish itself and entrench itself. We've seen growing intolerance for dissent for any alternative political views. But even in Australia, in my own country, we've just had a very serious debate around uh, new national security legislation, which to my eyes has a disturbingly similar echo to what was being introduced in Egypt, where the government has defined, uh, it, it, the, the legislation is around espionage, and the government has defined um, a criminal act under the espionage laws so loosely that simply receiving a document from a civil servant, a classified document from a, from a leak or from a source, can, can wind you up in prison. The law, if the law can be loosely interpreted, at some point it will be loosely interpreted. And, and the problem is that, that when it comes to the issues around national security, public safety, which are the kinds of things we keep hearing um, in the Philippines to justify all sorts of closing down of public space, that with that comes back a, role, a, a, a retreat from democracy, a retreat from freedom of speech, a retreat from a free press. And I think that's something that is incredibly dangerous. We're seeing it more and more. Um, and because it is politically acceptable for politicians to argue to be, to be strong on, on national security, to be strong on public security, without serious critical thinking, it's very easy for the, for, for the public to say, yes, of course, we must do that because we all need to be safe. Thank you very much. Um, we will follow up on some of your excellent points in the Q&A portion, but for now, we'll hear from Dr. Encinas of the Political Science Department. Hi, um, good morning to everyone. I'm delighted to be here, and I thank Professor Clarissa David for inviting me to this panel and to this very timely and relevant conference. Um, what is fake news for me? Um, I draw from the definition of Alcott and Jensko when they refer to fake news as news articles that are intentionally and verifiably false and could mislead readers. The operative terms I think here are intentionally and verifiably false. While this definition encompasses some of the things that we have read in the local news as well as from abroad, I think we need to also add a dimension of fake news proliferation as being systematically implemented mainly to account for the study, study of Jonathan Ong and Jason Cabanas, which I understand will be presented tomorrow, which tells us about how fake news is operated at different levels. How is fake news different from disinformation? Fake news produces disinformation that can harm individuals and societies in many ways. And indeed, a threat to democracy in general, particularly because it undermines the positive role of media in democratic societies. It legitimizes government crackdown on the media in general and has a chilling effect on the opposition who may be wary of being targets of fake news. It can also be used by authoritarian regimes to manufacture legitimacy, such as in the case of Prime Minister Hun Sen, who has been accused of the Cambodian opposition of buying Facebook likes. According to the news report about the petition, Hun Sen's page is liked by 9.4 million people, even though only 4.8 million people use FB in Cambodia. <laughs> and despite the fact that the page is written in Khmer. Well, as a trivia, I also follow Justin Trudeau's uh, Facebook account, even if I don't know French. Fake news can also prop up support for controversial government policies. We have seen this in the Marawi conflict in which fake photos and what have you proliferated, mainly with the aim to generate the support to martial law in Mindanao. Fake news can lead to violence as when a man in the run up to the 2016 elections in the US fired at a pizza restaurant thinking that there are children held as sex slaves inside. 
with alleged links to Hillary Clinton. Fake news can also de deny the legitimacy of political foes or enable politicians to dismiss accountability by branding as fake news any media report alleging corruption by the administration. Lastly, which for me is very important when we talk about democracy, is that fake news enables anyone with a misogynist agenda to use gendered language, manufactured fake images, videos, etc., to malign women, especially women politicians, and undermine women's role in politics, which we have staunchly fought for since 1937. This is abhorrent and discourages many women from entering the public sphere. It denigrates, quote unquote, the feminine, to quote the feminist scholar V. Spike Peterson. Even Hillary Clinton during the 2016 elections in the US fell victim to this. In the Philippines, we can see this currently being done by both those who support and resist the current administration. For those who are lucky, their fake news can even merit a congressional investigation to be feasted on by mostly male legislators. Women and the LGBT community are the prime targets of fake news as this bodes well for its clickbait nature. Why do misogynist fake news sell? Because they strike at what is familiar, the gendered hierarchies to which most of us are socialized. That the poster girl of fake news in the Philippines is a woman, I believe is not an accident, but by design. Misogynist fake news is pernicious because we may identify that it is fake news, but we laugh at them and even share them at times, which tells us that misogynist fake news may even sell better compared to other types of fake news. The end game for all this is what I would call the boy who cried wolf syndrome. Nobody will believe the media when it is already telling the truth. Who, can, who then can we turn to who will guard the guardians, especially in these times when our political institutions are being attacked in all fronts? The media as the fourth estate must be the beacon of hope during this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Franco. Uh, I'll turn to, I have a question for, for Cheryl. Do you think that um, there's something different about this information? You talked about the difference between what's intentional and unintentional. Do you think that it's, there's something specific about intentional disinformation campaigns when it's state orchestrated or when the source is a state because we often hear that this has been around propaganda has been around forever why is it something that we should be concerned about today um, as a special problem i think intentional and orchestrated disinformation is particularly critical in the context of social media which has a high possibility for programmability and manipulation, right? So if your strategy is intentional, deliberately planned, well orchestrated, you really can study the system. Well, as mentioned by Ron earlier, you can study the audience, you can study the messaging that will work in relation to your audience, and then use the system's affordances to make sure that your message is well amplified and reaches your audience at the very moment that you need it to spread. So I, that I think is dangerous. Um, it, it can be used by activists as well, by journalists as well, but the fact that it can be used by people of particular kinds of intentions is what's worrying. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think there's also another point where, and I, I want to be very careful <coughs> to un underline the fact that I'm not anti-social media, but one of the things is if we go back to the days of pre-social media, if the government lied, the journalists acted as gatekeepers, and we had a responsibility, a professional and ethical responsibility, but also a commercial incentive to check and, and cross-check and call out those lies. It was very difficult for the government to communicate directly with the people without going through the media, without going through the journalists. They could still hold news conferences and issue press releases, but journalists doing their professional jobs would fact-check and call out anything that they felt was, was wrong. And that doesn't mean that we weren't victims of misinformation, as Cherian was saying earlier when he spoke about um, the, um, the Gulf War and the lies that uh, President George W. Bush told. But the fact is that that system has, to a, to a greater or lesser degree, kept politicians reasonably honest as well as ourselves. But social media has allowed us to open up pipelines directly from politicians to those people who, who support them. And the problem is that we all like to see and hear and read news that agrees with our opinions. If we see and hear a politician saying something that we like or we agree, if it feels truthy, then we tend to like it and we tend to support it and, and continue to promote it. Anything that contradicts that view, even if that view is wrong, 
all of a sudden becomes fake news in our own lives. And, and that's why I think we're seeing things really turbocharged in the current environment in ways that we've never seen before. Now, that doesn't mean I think we should roll everything back to the good old days when there was no social media. <coughs> Clearly, social media has a lot to give us. But we need to recognise the problems, and I think we need to be a lot more aggressive in the way that we design the structure of the system, the checks and balances, to make sure that we do have the capacity to hold politicians to account, to keep them honest, and that we do have the capacity as journalists to produce stories that genuinely challenge those in power. And um, I do, uh, just maybe as a brief backgrounder, if some in the audience are not familiar, there have been, I think, two or three Senate hearings to try to come up with um, or propose legislation to address the problem of fake news and disinformation. Uh, and there have been many attempts to try to discuss whether legislation is the solution. And I think, uh, Mr. Uh, Peter, you also are in a unique position to discuss this, is what are the dangers of legislating against, because there seems to be this moral panic that we are all in where we say, this is something that needs to get fixed, it's so broken, and it seems like the initial reaction has been to try to design legislation. What are the dangers of that? So yeah, I think there is a huge, a huge danger that where you try and impose legislative solutions on this, um, Again, let me go back to what happened to us in Egypt, where the government introduced some legislation that on the face of it was designed to protect national security. It was designed to stop promoting terrorist ideology. It was designed to stop the spread of false news to undermine national security. Now, the problem was, and, and on, as I said, on the face of it, it's very difficult to argue against any kind of law that would, that would um, protect the country from terrorist ideology. Well, the problem was that the government then de defined terrorism so loosely as to include what most people would consider to be the political opposition. And so as a journalist, when we went out and interviewed the opposition, the Muslim Brotherhood at the time, we put that to air. As far as the government was concerned, we were, by definition, therefore, promoting terrorist ideology. The government branded the opposition as terrorists. We were accused of broadcasting false news to undermine national security. Again, on the face of it, a piece of le legislation like that is hard to argue against. But that's how it was interpreted. Now, when you introduce laws to try and, and deal with that sort of situation, as I mentioned earlier, the Australian government has been doing something similar. After a very fierce public debate, I might want to add, the government has been forced to roll back on some of that, on, on the more draconian elements of that legislation, of that bill. But I think the trend is there, and this is the problem, that when you criminalise these kinds of transgressions, you give a lot of power to the authorities to use that as a tool to silence free press, and it becomes anything that challenges the integrity of the state, anything that undermines confidence in the state institutions can be interpreted as the political opposition. So I have real problems with legislative solutions. I think there are, way, there are things that the government can do to create the kind of architecture around social media, to encourage, um, encourage legitimate reporting, to, to discourage fake news. These are, much, these are solutions for people, for lawyers and the like, with a much higher pay grade than, than, than I. But I would caution against um, introducing, being in a, in a rush to introduce laws, particularly draconian laws, to try and stop fake news. Because again, remember, Fake news, as far as the government is often concerned, as far as politicians are concerned, and we keep hearing it time and again, we saw President Duterte using the term, fake news becomes anything which contradicts me, anything that undermines me. That, by definition, definition is, is fake news in the eyes of, of government, and that means that every person in this room who's doing their jobs as a journalist becomes guilty of that. Thank you. Um, Jean, what do you think... Um how do you deal with this when the population seems to be so supportive? Um, it seems supportive of, of many types of solutions that are criminalizing behaviors, that are trying to stamp out the job that the press is doing and trying to limit free speech. We see a lot of the discourse really talking about um, how we should restrict uh, some of these freedoms in the context of trying to change the constitution of the country. What do you think about the public support aspect of it? Um, the public support aspect is there, of course, but I think for, for um, senators or for legislators, they're I more interested in <laughs> curtailing press freedom because they're really not interested in campaign finance reform. 
Because that to me is, uh, I think one of the solutions, especially that the 2019 elections is, is coming. I think a lot of politicians, uh, and we're seeing, we're seeing that already nowadays, are going to use social media to their utmost advantage because it's cheap and it's uh, getting uh, a lot more uh, people in such a short time. Do you think, maybe Cheryl, you can comment on this, how should journalists now deal with their position in the market? Because it seems like a lot of the attacks online um, and the attacks also on television and in the statements of the president and uh, other officials of the government has been to try to undermine the credibility of journalism, the practice itself. Uh, how can journalists try to gain the trust of the public again? Well, m my, my initial idea is you really just have to fight bad false news by good journalism. Journalists should show what they can do and what they can do differently, right? That they can actually come up with evidence-based articulation of information, um, as had been shown in the video earlier, right? And I, I think that's the only way to go. Um, perhaps nuggets there about how to amplify that information so that they can reach the public, per and perhaps they can work with a lot of different organizations as well. Uh, th this is a special um, event where of CSOs, academics, journalists have come together in mounting. So I think um, if we are serious about this, journalists can co-develop different kinds of strategies with other kinds of um, um, sectors to help um, in supporting evidence-based articulation of ideas. I think self-regulation is really the way to go. There's also one thing that bothers me, and I don't know if uh, it can be classified as fake news or whatever, but there's this, um, I mean, even before social media, there's already this uh, practice of uh, um, uh, weaving um, advertising within radio or TV programs. I don't know how you call it, but s most people are not interested, are just interested in listening to the news, but not interested in knowing where to get a liver capsule or a juice, uh, not even uh, vetted or uh, uh, approved by the FDA. So I, I think, I don't know, but that's, that's something that should also be, be uh, reviewed. I'm yes, just going to weigh in here because I think one of the problems is we, 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 in this debate, we tend to lose sight of some really important fundamentals. Let's go back to basics. Remember, the media is the fourth estate. That's to, it's supposed to sit alongside the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. We're the fourth pillar. We're supposed to keep the bastards honest. <laughs> we easily forget the politicians work for us in a democracy. That's how it's supposed to work. We hire them when we vote for them. We pay their salaries through our taxes. We are their employers. So as their employers, we have a, a responsibility to know what is being done in our names in a democracy. We tend to forget that. And, we tend, and as journalists, as the media, as academics, we've lost sight of that argument. We need to make that case. And we need to make that case as a unified industry. I, it, when, what happened to us in Egypt was a rather extraordinary thing because I know from, from my own personal experience that journalists are a really fractious bunch. We, the only time we tend to ever move in the same direction is when there's a bar in the room. <laughs> Otherwise, we tend to fight each other. I mean, that's who we are. We're, by nature, we're, we're cantankerous, noisy, rowdy lot. We tend not to, to agree with each other. But what happened to us in Egypt was an extraordinary example of, one, of what you can do when the industry pulls together as one. I, I know in this, um, in this country there were thousands of journalists, people who were tweeting free AJ staff, and journalism is not a crime. The free AJ staff hashtag received something like three billion impressions during the time that we were in prison. It, happened, it wasn't just here, it was all over the world. CNN, BBC, and not just Al Jazeera, all of our colleagues in Australia, there was an extraordinary unity of purpose. And what that unity of purpose did was that it sprung three innocent guys from prison. And I don't know anywhere else where that's actually happened. Now what we need to do is refine that sense of purpose, remind the public what it is that we have a responsibility to do and do that job well, and remind them that we need to keep politicians to account. We need a free 
strong independent press because fundamentally you cannot have a strong democracy unless you have strong journalism. So how, how can we, because I think for this country, the scale at which the attacks have been coming is very quick. And I think maybe there are lessons from around the world that we can, we can draw from. Um, do you have any insights from what you've seen in other countries in terms of tactics? Is this something that's unique to the Philippines where you have state institutions trying to actively undermine the media's credibility in the eyes of the public? Well, no, I mean, what we saw in Egypt was, an, was another example of that. Um, and a, to a greater or lesser extent, we see it take place in places like Turkey and, and Russia and elsewhere. Um, this is not an easy thing, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that there is a simple f switch, a solution, an easy, easy option. But I do think that there needs to be a, a kind of coming together of minds and a recognition that we all, as, as, as the media, as a journalist, and frankly, as a, as a democracy, we've got a, an interest in holding together as a block, as a unified media industry, as a group of journalists, all pushing in the same direction. That's very difficult when we're all desperately scrabbling around to survive, when we're all trying to win clicks and eyeballs and advertising revenue. But we've also got to recognize that, frankly, our own survival depends on coming together, of, of finding that common sense of purpose, whether you unite around a single hashtag, whether there is other conferences like this, because this is a really important and valuable start to this, that we need to, to constantly remind people and, and give people the same message. We're not very good at that as journalists because we always like to, um, move, to find, the, find the story and move on. As, as Ron was saying in the last, in the last panel, um, a lie told over and over again is much more powerful than a single news story. And as an industry, what we like to do is give a news story. You're constantly told that you're not to open your mouth, you're not to put pen to paper unless you have something new to add. We have to take a leaf out of the public relations industry and keep banging on that message time and again. Again, it's got to be consistent, it's got to be unified, it's got to be across the industry. If that happens, then I think we might start reminding people why it's important and start pushing back. Gene, you, what are your thoughts on um, this, the very basic idea of the media as the fourth estate? Is that something that from the political scientists in the country, is that something that is, um, that has been present in our politics and has it been rooted enough so that it's not so easy to displace that idea? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, uh, in the history, for instance, of, of uh, um, Philippine politics, media has, uh, given us or has provided us a very integral role. And I don't think we can afford not to have uh, a free media. It's uh, it certainly helped advance our democracy and any attempts to curtail press freedom should be uh, combated. And I think this conference is a good start and may this just be a beginning of a concerted effort to fight for press freedom. Yeah, I, to I, I totally agree with Peter and uh, Jean on this. J just, just a point of reflection also though that some people have found an avenue for expression on the internet freely because they may have felt that traditional media is exclusive to, uh, to certain people, w w intelligent people who can, who can, who can pass through editorials, uh, editorialized um, um, writing for example. So uh, w I guess w one way is to show how journalism can be inclusive of, s speaking of people's common issues as well, um, and at the same time challenging perhaps um, articulations of some people that media is biased, that, be, that, that the media represents only particular sides or views, as, uh, because, because the other side is using that, pr that, that, that as, a, as a reason for, oh, well, the internet is democratizing, actually. It's allowing ordinary people to speak when they haven't been able or given the chance to speak before. So I think it's crucial to, to challenge those assumptions as well and by, by simply showing that the media has a very important role as the fourth estate of the country. I'd just like to invite people who have questions to please hand over your questions to the lovely, uh, our lovely assistants in the room who are in the side. Uh, but maybe uh, before we get our questions, what do you think now that we've had this, social media has allowed for these direct relationships between the public and the politicians. 
uh, and this has been here for quite some time. Uh, it's almost it's almost organic right now that all politicians will have a Twitter account, all politicians will have a Facebook account, they will answer uh, specific questions from their constituencies. Uh, how does the press sort of go back to its role and say, we have a role to mediate this relationship, there is a function for the press. Uh, now that you have a population, or in a generation really, that's used to it, um, I, I wish I had an answer to that, an easy answer. Um, I don't think it's right, and I think what you were saying a moment ago is, is really true, that there is, that, that, that the internet, that social media has given, has created a democracy of voices, and we did have this arrogant period when we as journalists kind of stood on our pulpits and, and handed down these sermons of information, and, it, and the public simply had to receive it, and there was very little feedback and, and we do need to learn a degree of humility about that and learn to become a lot more responsive to, to news or uh, to um, various voices that were otherwise shut out of mainstream media. I mean there is a reason why social media has taken off because it does have power, it does allow direct conversations that were never allowed before. But we also need to take heart from the recent uptick in subscriptions for news organizations like the New York Times and the Washington Post, particularly in the Trump era, as people are starting to look for, for anchors of information and analysis that they can trust, of sensible, solid, fact-based information. Because let's face it, facts are stubborn things. Whatever people talk about the, 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 the sort of durability of lies, facts are fundamentally much more, they're, they're stubborn things that you you stub your toe on time and again. And I think it, it, it's, with, again, without wanting to sound too woolly about it, the fact is that if we can start to regain some of that professional integrity, start to step back a little bit from the desperate struggle for clicks, then, and, 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 and hold that line um, on professionalism, on analysis, on, on accuracy and integrity, then I think we, we might start to, roll, to, to reclaim, reclaim some of that that ground, but I want to go back to what I was saying earlier, we're not going to do it unless we remind our audiences of why it is really important that they pay attention to, the, to that kind of work and they make the distinction between fake and, 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 or cheap news or unreliable sources and those that they can really trust. Go ahead. Yeah. What's interesting, you, you were asking the question of uh, what does it do for us that politicians and people get connected via social media? I would say that this is precisely what we wanted when we were advancing e-governance and e-participation, right? Like, <laughs> even at 2006, we, we wanted politicians, officials of government to have a direct people to have direct access to these politicians and local government officials. And we, we wanted different kinds of ways to make the budget, budget uh, more transparent. I think it's really a question of intention and, of course, the tendency of the systems to get abused. So. It's, it's really tricky because we wanted this, <laughs> except, not, well, not exactly what we have, but we aspire to have more connection between local government officials and the people. Okay, let me turn to the, now it, it just took the audience a while to get the questions in because they're essay, essay type. <laughs> no, they're fantastic questions. I wanna make sure we, ha we try to cover as many of them as possible. Uh, here's the first one. Would it be correct to say that polarization of society into political factions, in the case of the Philippines, Duterte-tards and yellow-tards and leftists, and all of the name-calling that's attached to that. Um, the polarization of society into political factions has caused or is one of the causes of misinformation and disinformation, and does this misinformation and disinformation also amplify the existing polarization of the country? Jean, do you wanna take a um, stab at that? I, I think um, to to engage or to even believe in that binary DDS or yellow tarts, it's a disservice to, to us Filipinos. We're just Filipinos, we're neither DDS or, or yellow tarts. Because if we engage in that binarism, then we're buying. I mean, I mean it, it, uh, encourages, it discourages us from saying the things we want just because we're uh, afraid that we will be labeled as yellow tarts. So I, I think we should uh, not entertain those thoughts. Um, yes, um, 
we have to admit it has uh, it has uh, escalated into polarization if some people would call it as such but um, in a sense um, if polarization is there then it means that there's a venue for us to actually um, you know talk about these things and um, express uh, our views on on what's happening I mean it's it's very difficult if we can no longer express our views on on what's happening uh, here's another question do you think that the willingness of the public to join the attack on the fourth estate indicates an impatience with democracy? We can't wait anymore. We need this fixed. That's a really, that's a good question. I'm, I'm, I've got to underline the fact that I'm not a Filipino. I don't have no experience of the Philippines, so it's very difficult for me to draw any conclusions or say anything meaningful about the Philippine experience here. But. There's no doubt, and again, I, we're going to sound a little bit like a broken record because um, the, me the fundamental messages are always going to be the same, but the, the discontent with the media is real and we've got to take responsibility for that and recognise what it means for us as journalists and academics. Um, that doesn't mean that we should simply throw up our hands and say, well, you know, there's nothing for us to be done, we just have to live with it and accept that we're all due, due to die. Um, what we need to do is, is also recognise that we're in a, f in a period of transition at the moment. I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, ten years ago, no one could have foretold the kind of world that we would find ourselves discussing today. And I think it would, uh, it, only, some, only a fool is going to pretend to know what it's going to look like in five years, much less ten years' time. So we are in a, in, a, in a period of transition, and that's one of the reasons why I think there's so much confusion and chaos and frustration with the way things are going. But we also need to recognise why people are frustrated, because they do feel shut out of the, out of the conversations, um, because they feel as though they're not hearing good information, because the media isn't able to deliver the kinds of analysis that they feel that they ought to be getting from us, all sorts of reasons. Um, but what we need to start doing, I think, is to, is to almost invert the question. Rather than say, how do, what's wrong with the system? We ought to be saying, okay, what is it that we want from the system? And how do we design the system to get us to that point? What do we require from the media in a functioning democracy? What do people want as consumers? And how do we create a system that will get us to that point? We're trying to patch things up at the moment we're trying to kind of running around almost like we've got this leaky boat and we're desperately trying to stick bits of plastic over all of the holes and we've lost lost sight of the fact that the boat just isn't working it's sinking and we need to completely rethink how we build it and that's a conversation that i don't think has been happening in in any country that i'm aware of okay there's a great question here is the idea of the fourth estate an analog concept in a digital world what should be the nature and role of citizen journalism in this new information environment? I'm going to throw that to Cheryl first, because I want to give you a hard time. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think citizen journalism is really important. Community journalism specifically, too. I think we have to be, we have to be really thinking about how good journalism can reach the people the most vulnerable. And this is where, I guess, citizen journalism, in partnership with you know, your, 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 your other established media institutions can work together in making people feel that local issues, community issues are really represented. Uh, th that's all I guess I have to say. I Maybe mean, Peter. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm <laughs> hugging the floor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think citizen journalism or community journalism is very important. Given that, um, uh, what he call this dailies, even the traditional media usually cover national news, and uh, we we actually don't know what's going on at the local level. Even uh, even during elections, we know who to vote for at the national level, but we hardly know our local councillors. Nobody votes during the barangay elections, so I think it's it's very very important uh, in terms of holding local politicians accountable. I'm, I'm going to have a crack here, I, and I'm going to respectfully disagree. 
um, because I think with, with, there's a danger of confusing citizen journalism with local journalism. There is a real need for local journalism, and I'm not discounting the role that citizen journalism has to play, but let's, let's be honest here. When we talk about citizen journalism, we mean amateur journalism. We mean journalism that is not produced by professionals. Now, I don't know, hands up here who would go to a citizen brain surgeon. Yeah, exactly. We, we, go to, we, go, we, we go to professionals because professionals know and understand the subtleties of the job that they're doing. I, I'm not suggesting that there is not a role for, for ordinary people to write stories and contribute information. That's important and valuable and as journalists we've got a, there's a, we have a responsibility to hear and, and deal with that information. But we need to celebrate and underline the, the, the need for professionals who understand the issues, who know how to check information, who, who know how to create a story with integrity, who know how to, how to, how to work independently, who know how to avoid, how to set aside their own prejudices to get to stories. That's what professional journalists do, not citizen journalists. Citizen journalists have access to grind and so on. I'm not suggesting by definition that, they, that they're compromised or that they're biased just that citizen journalists are not professional journalists. Uh, and we need to make sure wh what it is that we're talking about. Local journalism is really important. Everybody is interested, much more interested in what's happening in the local council. They're much more concerned about the potholes in the street being fixed than they are about foreign policy. All of the surveys keep telling us that. And that's really important. We need to find ways of financing really good local journalism. But that's a structural problem. It it's not a, not a way, I think, for not a justification for handing over the baton to amateurs. Thank you. Um, the, related to that, um, and this is a room full of journalists and bloggers, uh, and, and that's an, an, an attached sort of identity is, is citizen journalism the same as blogging? Uh, and in the, it, when they're operating in the same in media environment where audiences start not being able to tell the difference between the products of professional journalists, um, bloggers, and citizen journalists, what happens, how, how does professional journalism protect its space and identity in that kind of audience market? And I think that's sort of an, an issue everywhere that the, the information environment has all of this content, and now you can't tell who's, who you're going to believe, and you're led by who you agree with as being the final arbiter of what you think is truth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, it's a, look, it's a, it's a real problem, um, and we, we, we operate in a space where certification and, and author authorization authority is a very difficult one. There, and again, I'm not pretending to have a solution to everything, but there is, you know, we have a system of accreditation of accredited journalists. Um, Twitter has its blue tick. People fight very hard to get that blue tick because the blue tick actually means something. Um, I'm not necessarily suggesting that that we all, that, you know, that only professional journalists ought to get blue ticks, but there, there is something in, in that system of, of verification. Whether we formalize it or not, I think this is, a, this is something that we need to be discussing, need to be debating. How do we single out, how do we identify credible sources of news? How do we accredit those journalists who have a reputation to uphold? Um, how do we, not necessarily license, but at least acknowledge journalists that's produced with professionalism and integrity and, and, and make the distinction between those and, and unreliable sources. We need to have those discussions. We shouldn't be shy about having those discussions. I think we need to try very hard to help audiences because there was a study in the United States recently um, that found that 75% of Americans were fooled by, by fake headlines. 75%. Now, even journalists are, are humans. I know I had to do a double take. I checked when I saw headlines saying that the Pope had, had endorsed Donald Trump for president. I thought, hang on a tick, wow. <laughs> That's quite something. The Pope's really going out on a limb here. 
<laughs> until, <laughs> but hands up those who haven't looked at something and, and thought for a, for a second, wow, that's, that's a really interesting story, and only to recognize after some time that actually it was fake. Well, if we struggle, if we're taken in from time to time, then of course others are going to, ordinary members of the public who aren't schooled and who aren't working in the industry as we are, are going to be fooled. We need to help them. We need to give our readers a way, the tools to make those distinctions as well. Um, as I said, I'm not pretending to have easy solutions here, but I think that we need to have some focused discussions, put some real effort, some real research into finding those kinds of, finding ways of verifying credible sources. In, in relation to uh, another question in relation to that and, and specific to the local scene is that where we have legitimate media organizations or news organizations in the Philippines that um, have established trust in the country over the years until very recently and is now being attacked specifically as being the main purveyors of disinformation and then other people or other sources of information are calling themselves the real media. How do we deal with, what, what are the dangers of that? Where, this is an, a specific example of how non-journalists or non-media entities are working to really undermine the credibility of the press in the Philippines. What, how can we bring back the value that the general public places on the products that our press um, churn out on a daily basis? Well, not, not directly addressing it, but perhaps also the danger of media manipulation um, in social media. There's um, the tendency, the vulnerability of, of in the internet is an attention economy, right? Um, everyone wants to get attention in social media, and um, the, the the goal is to when when one sees something that's attention worthy, one wants to present it as as as, as fast as possible. And in the context of this, those manipulators of this information may get some media organizations, journalists even bait them into actually reporting or highlighting this. And I guess that's where um, s some sectors um, question some, a some, some sectors of the media for, for becoming victims of, of disinformation as well. So I think challenging that um, and being cautious about <laughs> architects of disinformation that may actually be targeting, specifically trying to manipulate professional media organizations, I, I think, our, I think our, our media institutions are getting more and more aware of that, um, including specific targeting them and discrediting them. But the, it's really a, a disinformation ecosystem, perhaps that's, and, and, and studies have been published on this in the US about media manipulation, really strategic media manipulation and how journalists, professional journalists should be worried and be cautious about. Jean? In, in relation to your point earlier about the, about the 2019 elections and the barangay elections, um, now that we're what, a couple of years or a year away from local elections, how do we help audiences distinguish between the regular propaganda that happens in any local election that happened, that happened before with more current efforts of disinformation that are uh, less benign, and not that any of those are benign, but um, more easily spread? Yeah, um, I, that's a difficult question to answer, but um, I think um, there have been solutions already proposed by some uh, enhanced media, media literacy trainings, and um, overall, I think there's also a call for humanities and the liberal arts to be enhanced in in all in schools and even in high schools. So that's that's but that's a long-term solution, uh, and that was why I was pointing out earlier that um, what happens to genuine media organizations when they're already telling the truth, people will uh, you know, be skeptical even if they see the real news. So um, I think it's, it's uh, always, um, it should be a practice for all of us to, um, because, yeah, because of the nature of, 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 of the internet, you, I mean, usually you're, you're, you're a very distracted consumer. <laughs> so you're very um, uh, prone to clickbait articles, and um, so that's uh, what's going for for fake news uh, purveyors. So I think it's best to always triangulate the information 
that we have, uh, verify with other sources. We know we don't have the time, but the least that we can do is not to spread it, not to share it right away. <laughs> In relation to that, there's um, a question here that asks about the 2019 polls. Do you think there is, there should be, legis not legislation, but rules from the Commission on Elections as regards disinformation and political campaigning? Yeah, uh, I think um, it's about time that we have a campaign finance reform. Um, to be fair, it has been lobbied by a lot of uh, civil society organizations a long, long time ago, even before the fake news issue came about. But nothing um, came out of it, mainly because it's very difficult uh, to, le to legislate these things, especially when politicians are the subjects and the objects of change. From the perspective of a practicing journalist, in an environment where journalism is under threat, like specific threats from state agents, um, which is happening here in the Philippines uh, with much more veracity lately, can journalists really still be expected to be neutral or is there an expectation of neutrality? Is that still the best way to go about this? Yeah, I think neutrality is a really important thing to hold on to, really important um, ideal and, and neutrality doesn't mean doesn't mean um, objective. We 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 sometimes I think get trapped into this idea of objectivity, and we we try and often sell the, the work that we do as uh, as as objective, and that's only ever going to get us into trouble because every single person in this room is going to go walk away with a different perspective about what was said in this panel. Not that anyone is lying, it's just, or, or, or is disseminating fake truth, fake news. It's just that each person will pick up different pieces of information, different things will be important, they'll have different priorities. And so I think we need to step away from the idea of objectivity. We need to stop pretending that we, we, we are somehow, as, as journalists, we are somehow dealing with um, facts like handing these things down on tablets of stone and make people understand that we have, that we are independent, but that we hold to certain values. That's accuracy, balance, fairness. Those are the things, and independence, those are the things that we need to be championing. And once people understand that, once they, they sort of recognize that every story has a particular, not necessarily a particular line, but but that they have, that they are, are, are challenging or running a story in a way in a, from a, a particular viewpoint, then we can start having a reasonable conversation about the work that we're doing. But if we try and pretend that we are somehow objective, um, then I think we, we're going to find ourselves in trouble. In, in relation to the, we're not, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to apologize to the audience because I have, Many questions here, clearly we're gonna run out of time, uh, but I will try to get through a couple more. Uh, specific to the current environment in the Philippines, the, um, there's a long question here in specific to the Inquirer. The superstructure that supports disinformation or fake news, the internet and social media, is also eating into the fuel that, fire, that fires up traditional media, ad revenue and circulation specifically. That has always been the vulnerability of Philippine media, arguably all media that's commercial in nature, that that vulnerability is even more uh, pronounced now with even our one of our top news out, outfits, Inquirer, um, feeling the pinch in ad revenue as its readers turn online for free content. In the Inquirer's case, that vulnerability has led to an ally of Duterte, allegedly, that's me editorializing, allegedly, <laughs> trying, uh, buying a majority stake in the paper. What are your thoughts on that? Where you have this vulnerability that's not really just on the audience side, but vulnerability of media from the commercial side of things and how um, political movements can, can um, exacerbate that. Um, there have been questions and suggestions for media organizations to think about alternative revenue generation mechanisms. Um, ads are crucial, and specifically sponsored ads, pushing them on Facebook, it's, it's crucial, but again, you, you become uh, prone to the, to, to, to the attention economy, right? So revenue, uh, alternative revenue generation mechanisms are being um, recommended that will, where 
I, I think some organizations are trying to do this now, right? Um, getting the support of organic support of people, people who really believe in the value of evidence-based journalism. Yeah, maybe the others may have other thoughts. Um, of course, we cannot deny. I think all of us are uh, one in saying that uh, media entities are uh, first and foremost business enterprises, and I think it's it's a sad. Um, part of our history that it's uh, every time um, there's an autocrat, the media is always a target. Um, and um, I think that's one way to, to curtail or to stifle dissent. And um, I guess uh, what we can do is to just, uh, you know, do things like this, uh, forum, and to always be vigilant in any efforts by, by this regime or other future administrations to uh, curtail press freedom because remember Erap Estrada also tried attempted to do that to the inquirer before um, so let's see what happens I'll have a last question that I'll pose to everybody as a closing because I think we have 10 minutes left uh, it's related to there's a couple of questions here interrelated related to the idea of inclusivity of the media and representing different voices uh, with the emergence of populism and this and the disinformation that comes with it, is it timely to ask, this, to ask the state of our media and democracy, has it been more inclusive? Is there a way to make it more inclusive and has it delivered on that, uh, representing the concerns of the common people or the common man? Mr. Chair, I will throw that to you since you're the one that first um, mentioned it. The, the problem with that is that it's really very difficult to measure. Um, is the current media inclusive? And what kind of participation do we really want? Is it an, and sometimes what's measurable is, is a more surface level kind of participation. How many likes, how many clicks, but is, is that really the kind of participation that we want, especially in, an, in, a, in a complex informa information economy where likes, clicks can be manufactured. So, I think we should be more concerned about the quality of participation that we're getting and the quality of discussions around issues where journalists could take a crucial role in leading, again, because information and evidence-based information is crucial first and foremost before we can discuss issues, and then invite people as, as openly as possible to come in and um, given their, their, their take on these issues. Um, I'm speaking as a media consumer and not actually as a practitioner. I think inclusiveness is still a work in progress. I see inclusiveness in terms of people that uh, media outlets quote every time they, they uh, report an issue. I think it's uh, very, very important. For instance, in the West Philippine Sea issue, we often hear or you know watch TV news uh, uh, report about uh, foreign policy, they, they quote or they cite, they interview uh, foreign policy makers, but they rarely interview people who will be affected by this on the ground, such as, for instance, Fisher folks and their families. Peter, last word. What do you think about participation and inclusiveness in journalism? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to pass on the, que the, the fundamentals of the question which dealt specifically with the Philippines because that's clearly something I... I don't really know about I'm afraid. But in general, what, what, is, what, is, what is it you think journalists have to adjust to in this, I, the idea that we expect so much participation from audiences, the yeah, well clicks, look, the likes, to, the engagement? We've got to, we have to be engaged. We have to be prepared to engage. You know, we can't roll, back, roll the clock back to a time, you know, sort of idealized past that we, we all might pine for, but know, never probably really existed. We've also got to recognize that, that technology has opened up so many opportunities for audiences, not just audience engagement in the sense that we stick a comments box at the bottom of every story, but that we, involve, that we in, encourage some kind of feedback loops. And this comes back to what I was saying earlier, where, where we really need to rethink the fundamental way that we design um, news organizations. One of the things that news organizations used to do was the product for, for news organizations was the readers. The way it worked was, if you think about it, the way it worked was that news organizations would sell readers to their advertisers. 
The readers were the product. That model is broken down now, and in a way probably for the better, because it forces us to actually be much more responsive to readers, to be more focused on what readers want and, and engaged with readers. But we need to rethink the design that, that creates a revenue model that supports that. Now again, I'm not, I'm not a guy that has a, um, a, a lot of experience or knowledge or understanding of that, so I'm not going to try and pretend to have any solutions. But it comes back to what I was saying earlier, where we have to, rec have to think about what it was that we want, the role that we want our media to play in a functioning democracy. Once we've answered that question, then we can say, okay, given the technologies that we have, how do we create that, how do we get to that point? Then I think we might begin to start answering some of these really difficult questions. Okay, thank you very much on behalf of the, on behalf of the panel. Thank you to our wonderful audience and your great questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to everything. I will leave this for the next panel. Maybe they would like to answer some of them. Please feel free to approach our guests in the sidelines. Um, and I think we should be ready for lunch at some point. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panelists and our moderator. We'd like to remind um, our audience a uh, couple of things. One, please bring your meal stubs with you. There are four buffet tables outside. It's a bit tight, but you may um, spread yourselves out uh, throughout the venue. And the ushers will make sure to guide you uh, through the four buffet tables. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. Please be back here by 1 p.m. for the next session. Thank you. <laughs>